today to have here Talia Gillis from Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School to talk with her a little bit about her paper, Big Data and Discrimination. Welcome to Oxford, Talia. Thank you. Uh, what is this paper about, this project? Um, so this project's about um, how to reconceptualize discrimination law um, in a context in which decisions are automated using advanced prediction technologies and big data. And we focus primarily on the credit pricing context to analyze the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, what brought you to studying this particular problem? So consumer finance um, has been a topic that I've focused on in the past few years. So understanding um, barriers to access to credit, um, barriers to paying, paying back credit. Um, and so kind of a natural um, question that arises in this context is what are the difference, uh, what are the different technologies doing with respect to access to credit? And that's how I got into this issue of machine learning and understanding kind of the effect of machine learning on this world of credit pricing. In the paper, you don't talk much about the bright side, basically, of machine learning and consumer finance. Uh, what are beneficial effects from your point of view of this new development? So I think one of the um, significant opportunities of kind of better prediction technologies is that you're kind of able to to have more accurate predictions about um, certain people's um, ability to repay the loan. And that potentially could mean a lot with respect to kind of um, extending credit to populations that you previously had avoided extending credit to um, because you're now able to make more of a prediction about their ability to repay and to price that credit accurately. I think there's also kind of a significant opportunity, particularly with respect to, to populations that um, have traditionally been excluded from credit markets with the idea of kind of big data and non-traditional uh, data sets and the idea here is that you no longer rely on the um, on the kind of mainstream institutional variables like credit scores that very often people kind of from lo with lower incomes and for certain neighborhoods are less likely to have credit scores or good credit scores but you allow them to rely on other variables that may reflect their credit worthiness but weren't taken into account previously. Mm. So access to credit for those who don't have access to credit right now or access maybe to uh, cheaper prices uh, than they get today. Do we have empirical evidence for these beneficial effects already materializing? So I think that this is still an emerging technology and so there's little um, kind of systematic empirical evidence. So I think particularly um, for a lot of these non-traditional lenders that are relying on, um, on these non-traditional variables uh, other than um, say FICO scores or other kind of credit scores, I think they very much have demonstrated that they're particularly reaching out to populations that were underserved before. So in the US, that could be um, foreign students who don't have credit histories or other um, recent graduates who don't have credit histories. And so I think very much these lenders are, are targeting these uh, populations that previously had difficulty in receiving credit. Now, as already mentioned uh, in introducing you, uh, there is also a potential dark side, and the title of your paper suggests that, that much, uh, about discrimination and big data, especially with respect to credit markets. So what are the specific uh, problems and issues that you're looking at in the paper? So I think one of the big challenges um, in this context is that our traditional structures of thinking through what might be of concern or not, just don't apply as easily into this context. So in the past, we very much uh, focused on um, the human decision-making component of credit pricing and trying to understand if, if the human um, decision-maker was biased in some way or considering something that they shouldn't. Um, that's no longer relevant as much in this new context in which it's kind of more transparent what's being considered on the one hand. But on the other hand, um, it's much harder to predict the effects of considering certain variables on the eventual price disparities. Um, the way you had before in a world in which you were considering kind of few variables and had a better sense of kind of the different outcomes that they would produce. And so the idea of the paper is to think through how to actually take advantage of the fact that we have some transparency that we didn't have before and use it in kind of reorienting what the legal regime should be focusing on. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about the methodological approach of the paper. How uh, did 
did you set out to find out uh, about uh, what really is going on and uh, what might be potential remedies to a particular problem that you have identified? So it was quite important to us to kind of combine some understanding of how the technology works and what results the technology produces and kind of using that to talk about how the legal regime would apply. And so a key component to the paper is this pricing, um, pricing simulation in which we kind of imagine a mortgage originator using past um, um, lending decisions to make future predictions about default and to price future credit. And I think through that exercise, we kind of try to illuminate what aspects of the existing legal doctrine would be hard to apply or maybe less relevant in this new context and where there might be actually opportunities to further develop the doctrine beyond what exists today. Mm -hmm. um, in the paper, you and your co-author uh, discuss various elements of the process of applying um, algorithmic decision making uh, to the credit decision of uh, the input phase basically, then the decision making phase, and then also the outcome phase. And um, finally you come up with a new idea relating to uh, the outcome phase. Before we turn to that, let's talk a little bit about um, the potential problems or deficits uh, from the perspective of a regulator when thinking about what to do with respect to the input phase and the decision-making process. Yeah, so I think it's it's very intuitive for people to, to focus on the input stage of what gets um, considered um, when making or setting up this prediction. And I think the reason it's quite intuitive is, first of all, the, the legal regime has very much in the past focused on the idea of let's exclude characteristics as kind of the first best in a way. And I think it's also intuitive because it's easier to grasp this idea that we want to exclude certain things from being considered. Um, and so it's kind of that intuition and that perceived opportunity in this context that we're trying to demonstrate that perhaps doesn't quite carry the promise that one would expect if what you care about ultimately is that kind of these pricing algorithms are treating people fairly. Um, and so we do that primarily through showing the, the limited ability of the um, exclusion to, to create less disparity. Right. Uh, so uh, the main contribution, as I see, that the paper is to suggest uh, something that you call stress testing of, of algorithms. Uh, can you explain a little bit um, how that would work and what the purpose of this is and what it would achieve from the point of view of remedying a perceived potential discriminatory effect of, of an algorithm. Yeah, so the discrimination stress testing really is kind of an elaboration of, of this idea that um, we should be doing a better job at thinking through what our outcome analysis should look like. And this is both because we think kind of um, scrutinizing the two earlier stages, the input stage and the decision process stage, is limited, and that kind of pushes us to develop more outcome testing, but also because outcome testing can be kind of much more accurate um, and much more meaningful in a context of machine learning pricing in which kind of more is known um, on the outset before a prediction is actually applied to borrowers. And so the idea of the discrimination stress testing is um, essentially a lender sharing their pricing rule with a regulator who can then apply it to a population and test the effect that that pricing rule will have on that population as a kind of um, forward-looking test of the impact of the pricing rule. Mm -hmm. So if I understand that correctly, you know, from discrimination stress testing, you would get new information about the potential effect of a potential algorithm or an actual algorithm on a certain group in a particular population. That, however, doesn't solve the normative issue of uh, whether society uh, wants to accept that or doesn't accept it, and if yes or no, on what basis does it? Yes, that's very true. I think that there's um, important normative questions that need to be answered prior, prior to designing the exact um, discrimination stress testing. So, for example, one of the normative questions that would have to be answered is um, which people, um, based on what criteria, do we think should be treated the same? Um, and so, for example, a legal regime that finds it important that women and men pay the same premiums for health insurance in a privatized health insurance context would mean that we'd have to make sure that our outcome analysis kind of guarantees that um, 
that sex is not used to, to provide different premiums for men and women. Right. Who should do the stress, stress testing? So that's an excellent question, and I think that there's a number of ways um, in which this test could be implemented. So one fairly burdensome way of, of thinking about this would require kind of the regulator to set up a licensing regime in which um, lenders would have to kind of pre-approve their algorithms before they're used to price particular um, loans. I think another um, type of way of implementing this test is requiring um, lenders that use algorithmic pricing to kind of run these checks to make sure that their um, algorithms are fulfilling certain criteria. Um, and I think to some extent, although um, it's always good to have kind of a watchdog from the outside making sure everything's okay, I think a lot of the lenders in this space, in this innovative space, also want to have some kind of idea of what kind of checks they should be running because they also ultimately want to, to comply with different notions of, of discrimination. Now, uh, looking into this uh, a little bit more in detail, uh, this is an area where technological knowledge uh, is located primarily in the industry. Uh, how shall a regulator be able to meaningfully design a stress test for an algorithm, leaving aside the tricky normative issue that we discussed, uh, and not be liable to be outgamed basically by the big players in the industry when implementing the test. So one of the advantages of focusing on the outcome or output stage is that a regulator is really not required to understand all the innings of how the algorithm is operating or what decisions are being made with respect to, to how the input data is being used. So in a way it kind of takes the bulk of the technological complexity and puts it aside and really keeps that within the domain of the private industry that's working to develop these algorithms. And by focusing on the outcomes, it's really kind of the stage that in some ways requires the least um, technological sophistication or understanding exactly of what the company is doing. Because what we're interested in is kind of the impact rather than how exactly it operates. Mm. Uh, do you think that uh, we should should see or would see some kind of regulatory diversity emerge worldwide with respect to that particular issue um, and uh, how could that look like? How could different jurisdictions basically uh, adopt different models for regulating this area? I think a big question in this context is um, whether it is something that the, the outcome analysis is something that we can rely somewhat on the outcome analysis of companies themselves versus the regulator offering their own kind of um, outcome analysis. And so I think some diversity at trying those two different types of regulatory regimes would really allow us to learn a lot about um, what would be the most efficient way to run these kinds of tests. Now on balance in concluding our discussion, uh, do you think that uh, given these challenges uh, of algorithmic decision making with respect to credit decisions, these significant challenges, uh, we can devise some kind of regulatory system that produces uh, some kind of net benefit for society overall, or should we rather wish that uh, we put the genie back into the bottle and this uh, would never have happened in the first place? <laughs> so, I mean, I think to a large extent, um, this is the future. Um, and so, um, to a large extent, this is kind of happening. And so the big question here is how um, does the regulator respond? Um, so this is not so much a question of the regulator itself using machine learning, but how to respond to the industry. But I think there are massive benefits to, to better prediction technology and to using big data in, in this context. And in general, to gain more transparency over exactly kind of what is happening in these credit decisions. I think that to some extent, um, the legal um, doctrine has been able to kind of develop into lazy law over the years because of the human decision-making context in which it wasn't, there were certain questions that couldn't accurately be, um, be analyzed. And so I think that also if we think of, of the benefit on the legal doctrine, I think ultimately will kind of emerge from the current confusion with a much better sense of what we want to achieve by our discrimination law um, and how we want to achieve it. So transparency, if I understand you correctly, more transparency than uh, we had for decades when humans were taking these difficult decisions might be uh, one key benefit of this development. 
Yes, I think that's right. And I think um, we're very much at this point used to um, thinking about machine learning as kind of a black box and opaque. But really, when you compare it to the human decision-making context, then um, you gain some transparency and you understand more of what the algorithm was trying to predict and how it was predicting it a lot more than when you think about kind of the human being who's making a lending decision of understanding the basis for that decision what was considered in that decision and so although machine learning does come with challenges of interpretability um, and as we demonstrate in our decision process stage of the paper um, there's various issues in terms of um, kind of variable importance analysis so understanding the decision rule um, overall, I think that there is an opportunity um, that's gained with respect to transparency in this move from human decision making to machine learning decision making. So, uh, Tali, if you were asked to summarize the main message of your paper in one or two sentences, what would you say? Um, so I'd say that there's a need to bridge the gap between old law and new methods. Um, and we argue that kind of focusing on, on input restriction, scrutinizing the decision process, is not the way to go, but rather we should be developing strong tools for outcome analysis. Now, given that you now uh, reached the stage where you produced some results, uh, what are the next steps? Where uh, is your research going? Which directions do you think are worth exploring further in the future? So I think two, um, two of the next important steps in, in this respect is first, kind of thinking through the regulatory details of implementing such a test. So the question of kind of who should implement it and how, but also putting more thought into this question of what should be the test for disparity. And here I think there's an important need to kind of bridge the gap between the computer science and statistic literature and the kind of legal and normative literature on the topic. Thank you. Thank you again for coming to Oxford and uh, for uh, being interviewed about this very interesting paper. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me.